It's a warm summer night. You are standing on the porch of your home with your family, watching as a strange, unidentified object moves across the sky. Suddenly it stops and turns and begins moving at an incredibly fast speed in your direction. It's on a collision course with your house. This scenario might sound like something out of a sci-fi movie, but it really happened to a family in New Zealand in the mid-1950s. It was June 1956, Wepakuro, Hawke's Bay, North Island, New Zealand. A witness, no name given, then 18, was living at home with her parents on their family farm. The farm, situated on the small Romney Marsh, bordered the Tukituki Riverbed on the north side. It was about a mile from the Wepakuro Township. The AMP showgrounds were on the west side. A neighbor's farm was on the east side, and Mount Herbert Road was on the south side. One evening in late June, the witness's father and brother had just returned from the woodshed and were in the process of removing their muddy boots on the back porch when they noticed to the north a very bright white light slowly moving from east to west above the Tukituki River. The father called out to the witness and her mother, to come outside and look at the strange light. The two women were inside preparing dinner, and by the time they had stepped out onto the porch, the light had disappeared. The two women had a good laugh, joking that the father and the brother were just seeing things. They returned to the kitchen to finish what they were doing. The two men remained outside, watching the skyline for any trace of the strange light. They would not be disappointed as, within seconds, it reappeared. They again yelled for the women to come outside, insisting that it was back. This time the women rushed outside and observed an amazingly bright light going up the river from east to west. As it was disappearing from view, they noticed that it seemed to gain altitude, and then it did something none of them expected. It turned and began hurtling at an incredible speed toward the farmhouse. The witness became instantly frightened and screamed to her father, asking if they should leave, that the object was most certainly going to smash into their house. She sensed that if it did, they were all going to die. Thankfully, whomever was piloting the object had other ideas, and instead of impacting the house, it came down between the cow shed and a line of pine trees by the home boundary fence which was approximately 50 yards away. At that distance, the object within the light was now clearly visible, a small silver-gray saucer-shaped object about the length of a car in width came to a halt and hovered about 20 feet from the ground over the lambing paddock, very close to where the dog kennels were positioned on the other side of the trees. A witness noted that it was emitting a very bright light that lit up the entire two four acre paddocks, which were divided by a line of pine trees running from the farm boundary to the Tukituki riverbed. The object lit up these two large paddocks as if it was in the middle of the afternoon. The sheep grazed seemingly unperturbed. The dogs, however, seemed to go absolutely berserk. According to the witness, they howled like she never heard them howl before. They leapt into the air frantically and strained on the end of their chains trying to get away. In the years since the sighting, the witness wondered if the object was giving off a high-pitched sound that was beyond human hearing range, but clearly audible to the kennel dogs. The witness claimed she was absolutely traumatized with fear, pleading with her father to explain what was going on. However, she soon noticed that her father, mother, and brother seemed to be transfixed on the spot while she hid behind her father. She recalls them just standing perfectly still without any movement, reaction, or conversation, almost as if they were in a trance. In those moments, she felt very afraid and alone. In attempting to explain it to UFO CUS investigators, she noted that the eerie silence from the object was perplexing and that the air around the family felt as if it was somehow pressing down on her. Thoughts of abduction filled her mind, 
She was terrified that someone or something was going to come out of that object and take them away. The object remained there for a few minutes before eventually lifting up into the sky, lighting up all the banks of clouds until it appeared to be moon-sized. Then it took off at a great speed due east. It then suddenly stopped and hovered, and in a flash moved due north and disappeared. When the witness's family regained their senses, they were amazed by what they could recall of the incident, but were not shocked like the witness herself, who had remained conscious throughout the event. She was overcome with fear and shook uncontrollably for several hours. She also had a severe headache which did not subside until the next day. No other member of the family experienced this. Afterwards, the father swore the family to secrecy, and they were not allowed to mention any of it to anyone for fear of becoming the laughingstock of the community. However, sometime afterwards, the father took his daughter into his confidence and told her that he had seen unusual things in the sky before and said that he would show her some of them in daylight. And true to his word, on another occasion they saw similar objects sitting above the horizon of the hills that were part of the neighbor's farm. On this occasion, there were three metallic-looking objects visible that were hovering tilted at an angle amongst the clouds. The witnesses often wonder what else her father had witnessed or experienced that he did not share with his family. It's an interesting detail that the family was placed into a sort of trance-like state while the primary witness was left unaffected. I do not know how the visitors were able to place the three members of the family into the trance state Maybe it had something to do with that high-pitched sound spoken about earlier, but given her uncontrollable shaking and the headache, I do wonder if more transpired than the witness could actually recall if she, like her family, was placed into a trance-like state too, only at a later period. The report indicated that the mother, father, and brother only remembered some aspects of the incident. The 18-year-old, as far as she knew, was alert throughout the whole experience, though it's possible that she was not. In 1956, the notion of alien abductions was almost unheard of, though the tremendous fear she felt, the sense that she was going to be captured by whomever was inside that craft, it does seem that she was somewhat familiar with the visitor's activities. The witness later learned that her father had prior experiences and she suspected that there was more that he was not telling her. Some ufologists believe that abductions are passed down from their parents to their children, and then to their children, and on down the line. I do wonder if this case is an example of that. Anyone familiar with the paranormal and cryptids will tell you there's a lot of very strange entities being reported, though for one man in Washington, his sighting certainly rings as one of the more bizarre. It was the mid-2000s. The witness was living with his parents in Vancouver, Washington. They lived on a cul-de-sac in Orchard Del Court. The witness recalled that he was heading to school. It was around 8 a.m. He only had to walk about a block from his house to where the cul-de-sac met the main road, St. James Road. The witness took that route almost every morning, and so that day was no different. As he neared St. James Road, he observed something that shocked him. I looked up from my feet and across the road was what I can only describe as a creature. It was made up entirely of black spheres. According to the witness, the figure was humanoid. It had two legs, two arms, a torso, and a head, though it was made up entirely of black spheres, about a foot wide, a little bigger than a basketball. If that wasn't creepy enough, the entity appeared to be, quote, dancing around a pole across the street. The witness claimed that it exuded pure malevolence. He sensed something truly sinister about the entity. I felt that this thing was bad. Really, really bad. When the witness looked at the sphere man, it immediately stopped dancing and looked back at him. Then it just, quote, popped out of existence. It did not fade. It did not make any sound. It was just there one moment, and the next moment it was gone. The witness was quite shaken by the encounter, but carried on to school. He assumed his experience was over. 
Curiously, on that very night, he was at home with his parents when they were alerted to a loud noise outside. Apparently, a very inebriated group of teens had decided to race their vehicles down St. James Road with tragic results. It was a terrible accident. Four of the five people involved perished. The fifth was severely injured. The witness, accompanied by his father, went outside to find out what was going on and observe the accident scene. I went out with my father to the corner where it happened. I was shocked because it was the exact same intersection where I saw that thing. I cannot help but think I saw something strange that morning, something I was not supposed to see. It does seem, given the tragic events of just a few hours later, that this entity was some kind of harbinger of doom, or possibly it was death itself though his description does not match any of our modern-day depictions of how death, the Grim Reaper, is said to look. Typically, it's a dark-cloaked entity, sometimes carrying a Sith, sometimes it's a skeletal man in a black suit, sometimes it's an animal. Though, this sphere entity is unlike any that I've ever heard before. The witness described that the sphere man appeared to be dancing when he happened upon it. Was it celebrating? Was it performing some kind of ritual? Upon becoming aware that it had been sighted, the entity seemingly popped or teleported itself away. This teleportation ability has been mentioned in other Grim Reaper reports, including the famous Polino case out of Utopia, Ontario. The witness sensed that he momentarily glimpsed something that he was never supposed to see. This is a common sentiment of people who encounter the unknown. Sometimes cases are so strange and so unnerving, it's hard to categorize them, such as what happened to a group of soldiers in Peru. July 14, 1993, Acalpa, Peru. Victor Landa, an ex-Navy officer, was leading an anti-smuggler commando unit consisting of 18 veteran soldiers through a jungle area in Peru looking for members of a criminal organization known as Sendero Luminoso. While patrolling the area, Landa noticed that he now suddenly had 19 soldiers instead of 18, one more than when he began the patrol. He was a little surprised and assumed that some kind of infiltration operation was being carried out on his unit. With the logistics assistance of personal code words of identification, he was able to identify the extra soldier. Curiously, he strongly resembled one of the other men in the group. It was uncanny. If you didn't know any better, you'd think the two men were twin brothers. After being found out, the strange look-alike soldier tore off into the jungle. As he ran away, he was fired upon by several of the commandos, though none were certain they hit him, as he seemed unfazed. About 20 minutes later, the men came upon the strange soldier again, and were stunned to see that he was now an exact copy of the second in command, a man named Camaro. How was this even possible, they wondered. Before they could interrogate him, he again ran off into the forest. He was shot at again by Landa's men without any apparent effect. As the men hiked on for another three miles, they had several more encounters with the soldier who seemed to be shadowing them along their journey. Each time he seemed to be able to alter his appearance, becoming an exact copy of one of the commandos belonging to the group. After hiking for two more hours, the final and most disturbing encounter played out. This time the chameleon-like entity had changed into an exact copy of Landa himself. Landa was so disturbed by what was going on that he approached the figure and fired point-blank at its forehead. To his horror, the bullet seemed to go through the figure's head without any effect whatsoever. The other men opened fire on the figure without any results. It just seemed to smirk at the group. It then turned and walked away into the brush, disappearing from sight. They did not see him again the rest of the day. I've never heard of a case quite like this before. I know of skinwalker stories in which they are able to alter their appearance, but this is probably the most extreme version of it that I'm aware of. I have to give Albert Rosales full credit for making me aware of this case, which was apparently looked into by investigators in Peru and featured on the Eugenotate website. 
It seems that this entity was not only able to alter its appearance at will, creating near-perfect imitations, but it was also able to survive being fired upon, which is impossible. It seems that Landa and his men encountered some kind of otherworldly force out there in the jungle, possibly a trickster-type being. It remains unclear what exactly the entity was hoping to accomplish, aside from just causing fear and mayhem, which I guess would be the ultimate goal of a trickster.